we're on. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, somewhat of a different flavor today to our COVID discussions because we are going to talk food. First, we're gonna chat with Fred Morin, owner of one of the most famous restaurants in Montreal, Joe Beef. And after that, we'll talk to Joel Teitelman, who owns a bagel shop in New York. And of course, we will discuss the difference between Montreal and New York bagels, not the New York bagels advantage. All right, first, we're gonna start talking to, to Fred about food. And you know, this is one thing that all humans have in common, we all eat. We all talk about what we ate, what we're going to eat next time, what we should have eaten. Uh, and by that time, it's time to talk about the next meal. So Fred, not only are you a restaurateur, but you're also a gourmand. You love food, right? You love uh, your beverages with, with the food. And you've established a restaurant in Montreal, Joe Beef, and a couple of others as well with your partner, Dave McMillan, and uh, have achieved international fame. You fed presidents. Uh, President Obama was there, you fed prime ministers, our own prime minister, and uh, better yet, you fed me and Emily. <laughs> Emily, of course, is here behind the scenes, minding the store, making sure that we feed the public the correct information today. So Fred, let's get down to uh, the restaurant business and uh, the business part of it first. Absolutely. You've been closed now for how long? About three months. Three months. This yeah, the March. A long. Yeah. And yeah. within the next two weeks, uh, you're going to be allowed to be open. Yeah, right? allowed to there be are, open. There are restrictions. Now, as far as you've been told, what are the restrictions? What will you be able to do and not able to do? Well, I think uh, first and foremost, we'll have to have, um, just pretend we're walking in the restaurant there. So I think we'll have to have... Uh, a hand wash station or like you've seen at the groceries or just um, uh, hand sanitizing pumps at the entrance. We'll have to have uh, immediate cleaning of the bathroom after. Um, we'll have to limit the tables to an amount of 10. We'll have to limit the space. There's no limit on capacities, but there's a limit on spacing between the tables. So it's this uh, iconic two meters, uh, six feet. Um, what is the capacity Viber. of your restaurant, just so we know, of Joe B, for example? It fluctuates. Between, like summer, we put people outside, um, I'd say like 70, 70 people. Okay. I think, I don't know, I think we'll look, Joe Beef Liverpool House, maybe around 50, 55 people each. I mean, it's not the good news. It's not the, the beautiful news that we wanted to hear that everything's back to normal. Um, that said, I'm aware that we were... We were aware from the beginning that this is a serious issue with public health consequences. And it's not only an, an, an issue of us staying open, it's an issue of, of the whole health system, the health is this to be handled as a pandemic, which it was, which it is by the public health authorities. And we have to comply. It's not uh, we can't have opinions. This is not hockey and a choice of a new French Canadian coach or should we trade the number two pick? This is facts, right? Yeah, well, we'll be talking about that in July because the NHL is going to open up training camps. And oh, I thought you were going to say we're, we're going to talk about that in July when the, when all the people show up to the hospital after they've been uh, to restaurants. <laughs> right. Well, so if you have to go down to 50, 60 uh, people occupancy, what does that mean for you financially? Can you survive with that? Sure, some restaurants, like some buildings we own, some we don't, um, will we'll be more um, more frugal, I think, uh, won't do the big renovations or this or that. But what I think is going to give us a chance to do something that I've been um, thinking about for a long time, which is a, a, a simplification in our menu. And the, the, the simplification in our menu will, will ease the workload, will make it will help us purchase more specifically from better farms, better producer. Um, it will make the items we have on our menu better because they'll be more mastered. And I think that's the way we have to go forward is like a restaurant that specializes in fish does fish. A restaurant that does meat does meat. A restaurant 
and then a lot of countries and in, in in the old days it was like that you know there's like you you did oysters you did oysters you did you were an italian restaurant you're an italian restaurant and there's been a i wouldn't say a trend but there's been a current and that goes with like i was talking earlier be, between us about the um a, a, a frenzied restaurant market of always more 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 and i think to go back to a, a, a simpler food and this is difficult because we're talking about like people who are eating now the young people who are eating now in restaurants or people my age that grew up on like super flavored Gatorade and uh and and taco spice and and you name it as part of our uh our food um, food paysage it's going to be hard to go back to the flavor of oysters with butter but i think it's for the better but your restaurant i mean you made your name on having sort of extreme right uh, foods interesting that you don't get elsewhere uh is that going to stay or or yes yes i think i i think it's extreme and i agree with the term extreme which is we'll have oysters and we'll have something We'll have soft serve ice cream uh, for dessert and oysters as an appetizer. It's uncommonly seen on, on menus. Um, we're very adamant in, into finding foundation for our food in like history, uh, in in science, nutritional science, and in, in in the upbringing. In our upbringing in Montreal, you know, uh, what what as a city, Montreal, we have the Iroquois origins we have all the populations that immigrated here you know the portuguese population the east european jewish community the italian community so all our food it seems at time a little bit extreme as you say but it it's it's found somewhere in history and we just find it sad sometimes that food there there is no museum for food um if it doesn't live it dies you know um nobody paints uh, nobody paints a uh, uh, nobody paints like uh, Van Gogh anymore, but you can still see the paintings. I mean, they're stuck in a museum somewhere. But once the last restaurant that served, when we opened the restaurant, it was the city, and you'll remember that it was full of La Ma des Oliviers and all those classic French restaurants. And if you look at it now, there's n none of these restaurants is is alive anymore. You know, so we 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 see it as a mission to preserve those institution through like like their ancient recipes or well, but you inside. also speak it's not only at your restaurant what your uh, restaurants what you're so well known for it's not only about the food it's so much about the experience and you see this when you know when Bourdain um you know visited you guys and you had you know the day together and everything and it's about the experience and the culture and like you're not only eating food you're eating up all of that right yeah absolutely and this is one thing where the um the proximity rule in sort the two meter distance. If you want at Joe Beef, you have a long bench on which people sit, a long banquette along the wall, and um, it's it's not very discreet because there's like five tables of two, six tables of two there, and in the end, by the end of the dinner, the meal, like people all talk together and all exchange, and and I mean it's a it's a, a self it perpetuates itself, you know the conviviality. Um, aspect of Joe Beef because the next people that come come happy and they sit down there and they chat to their their neighbors and this is another thing where is it just food do you sit down we, we it's it's an into it's a very interesting uh, experiment we did by delivering food from as I say notorious or known restaurants in takeout containers that are eaten out of context so totally it really brings to mind what is the context, the context, the company, the playlist, the decor, the ambiance, uh, everything. Yeah. The ambiance. What I think, well, and I think we've realized that it's it's there's there's has to be a vital energy in a contact between people, because and I know that um, a religious service online is not a religious service online. Uh, a dinner online is not a di dinner online. A delivered meal is not uh, is not the same. And for a lot of restaurants, the food doesn't even pass the test of the foam box. So whether you took the foam, the food out on a, in a foam box, ate it on a park bench, you know, it doesn't stand for itself, you know. Oh, and especially in your case, where people come there because of the overall experience, the ambiance and the 
the batter, you know, the patter back and forth with the waiters and the waitresses and, and all of that. Now, we talked about about the um, economics and, and I mean, let's say it can all work with the reduced capacity. Question is, will people come at the same rate as they were coming before or will they be worried about, uh, you know, sitting in a place where there are others that they don't know, even though they may be two meters away? I think this is the... Uh this is the the million dollar question because we've been uh, we've been hanging on the lips of Dr. Arruda and 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 Premier Legault here, um, which somehow did a good job not being alarmist. But as you know, people in the era of fake news, just a wrong message. I just let me just put it this way. I really hope that they took this decision not lightly. Okay, that they took it knowing that from here, with all the facts in hands, they think it's going to go better, but not worse. I don't think, I, I hope they didn't take it under pressure just because people had to reopen. And then uh, the week after the press conference is a pessimistic, morose, uh, CHE, CHSLD, people shouldn't go out in restaurants again, whatever. I just think that, I just really, really hope that they took that decision, and in all their press conference, their release, their 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 relation in the future, they're gonna port, they're they're gonna try to um, preach something more positive. Because if they leave the restaurant open, and then they don't act optimistic, then the people. And then the other question is, do people actually listen to the government in in this instance? Which I, I don't. You know, like there's, uh, we've seen people join protest in spite of, of the, the virus um, fear. You know, we've seen people. Um, I've said many times before in this context that the only thing we can predict about this whole situation is that it's unpredictable. Yeah. No, nothing that has been predicted has been accurate. Things have always turned out different from what, what the predictions have been. So with the rest, restaurant business right now, I, I don't think anyone knows. It, it's going to be trial by fire. You'll find out what it is. <clears throat> Unfortunately, one thing that we do know is that the risk is greater sitting indoors with a lot of people in a confined space than it is outdoors. So, yeah. I mean, the restaurants are saddled with that problem. It's, and uh especially restaurants where people are going to spend a significant amount of time in a relatively small space. And I, I think that's going to play on people's minds. Maybe uh, eventually, I don't know, I haven't been following that that closely, but if the antibody test is accurate, then we can, that could help comfort the general yeah. population knowing that the oh. testing will, you know, start to become meaningful. And uh, okay, let's let's switch gears a little bit here. Uh, I mean, you're famous for the food that you serve, all the uh, interesting, unusual things. Uh, what did you serve President Obama? Well, you know what? That day, I wasn't working. That was David's. Uh, that, that was David's doing. Um, but I can tell you that he had uh, local halibut with uh, wild mushrooms and corn. And what about uh, our prime minister? I think they ate from the same plate, metaphorically uh -huh. <laughs> and, 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 and li realistically. You see, all, the sh all that's all the sharing, all the sharing yeah. that's done at your type of that's restaurant. Well, well you know, that's, and, that's, and that's, that's where the, the table is very important, you know. Um, we now realize that all those business meetings, all those conferences that have been like transferred from uh, in the flesh to um, Zoom or Hangout or whatever, have not been bringing the same uh, results, right? When people have a conference, it's 11 o'clock, there's a talk, a business talk, everybody's around the table. Meh, you know, there's, people are uncomfortable, you know. And then they show up around a, a, an actual dinner table and then they, they start talking and they break bread. Of course, a, a little bit of wine, it loosens the lips. Um, and then people feel more comfortable. I don't know if it's a primitive fear of like seeing people eat the same as you. So you actually don't think you're going to get poisoned or whatever. I'm not going into like evolution theory or anything, but you're sitting down and you're eating with people. It's a, it, it, you're, you're even and you're comfortable. 
and your 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 primal need is being met. So, okay, what do we do about that deal? Yeah, no problem, you know. I think, in fact, that a lot of consultation in psychology should be done around the table since a lot of the issues that they hear might relate to the table. Yeah, unfortunately, this is what we're stuck with. And one thing I, I think important to point out is that this is a respiratory virus. It's not an enterovirus, so you don't get it by eating the food. That's, that's not a concern here. You worry about breathing in the exhaled breath of, of people around you, not, not the food. But one thing that does come up is, is sharing food and passing plates to each other. Because there, there's the chance, you know, that someone touched it with a hand that they just used on their face, and then you touch it and touch your face. That's a possibility. I think it's an it's a unlikely possibility, but it is possible. So are, yeah. are you thinking anything about that, about telling people not to share the plate or? Well, listen, people will do what they want at the table. And I hope that the government doesn't insist on asking us to police people inside the restaurant. Um, you may remember, and I don't know, especially in, in, in history where it, it came in, but probably after one of the pandemic, um, New York was famous for his automats restaurant, you know, and you would walk in. I remember, I remember would, going to New York in the early 60s and yeah. uh, eating from those automats. Yeah. So I have a friend of mine uh, who has a butcher shop that's inspired on that, you know, and he did that prior to the like the, the whole pandemic uh, or this recent pandemic. But if you know, if you think about it, there might be a solution and that. But is that what we want? What, you what, know, do we want you, food to be can you explain? so safe? Well, the automat was a big, in fact, it was a bit the theatrical because there's a big wall of little doors with prepared food that you just oh. put money inside and open a door, oh. but the food was prepared behind. The only thing you'd avoid is direct contact with the person, you know? Um, Interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Is it is it going to become that, you know? That's another um, level of dining. Yeah, absolutely, you know, and 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 again... I really hope that when people go to the restaurant, people will be careful, the restaurant will be careful, and you'll be able to um, not think about that and have just a... Yeah. A, you think you're going to have to make any kind of changes with the cooking, the whole cooking process? Uh, uh, we... Um, we don't like i mean like you said it's not an enterovirus so like things like tartar things like that are not um you, you're not at risk um uh, i think if we do changes we're gonna do changes towards the menu to make it satisfying and pleasing and comforting for people and and, and you know if you eat in comfort then you don't trigger those stress hormones or what's not and I, if you eat happy you digest better i don't remember exactly how your kitchen layout is is, is it an open kitchen or well it's a semi-open kitchen it's slightly bigger than your library behind you yeah so are, are you gonna have to put uh plexiglass or anything? we are gonna put plexiglass in some places you know the oyster bar uh, we are going to put plexiglass, um, perhaps doors. We're going to create new spaces outside, new openings, windows. Um, the, the breeze seems to be like a thing, you know, very helpful. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it's also a case of a day at the time in that. I, I, almost, I, I almost wonder... I almost come about? Excuse me? Joe Beef, the name. Where did it come ah, from? Ah, Joe Beef. In Montreal, uh, 18th century, uh, 18th and 19th century, there was um, there was a um, a guy who was in the British Army, and he was um, he was an, an old uh, um, cantonier. He was an old uh, chef for the military, and his name was Charles McKiernan. And the legend was that he, he was able to find beef at night for the troops who were fed on uh, groats and gruel and um they, they called him joe beef and he opened a tavern in the old montreal and uh when we opened the restaurant we wanted a, a name that was meaningful so we did uh, a lot of trips to the mccord museum 
and then we uh, we found that name, which was completely forgotten. And it, the last iteration of Joe Beef just, in, in fact, just closed, I think, in the 70s or 80s. And at the time, it was a bar. But it was like the Merchant Inn. It was a, he was a union supporter. It was all kinds of things. In fact, when they closed, um, half of the business district um, for his funeral when he died, so people can follow the procession. Yeah. So tell me, uh, with the growing interest in plant-based foods and vegetarian and vegan diets, has that had any impact on you because of the name Joe Beef? I mean, what, people would not know that the story that you just told us. People would yeah. think it's called Joe Beef because that's all you get there. Well, we've, <laughs> we've, been, uh, we've been surprised with a few uh, happenings or sit-ins or scream-ins by vegan protesters lately. Even last week, we had some graffitis uh, in front of the restaurant that said, "We, you have blood on your hands, you know. I just didn't have time. I wanted to replace blood by Purell and the graffiti. But, um, I mean, everybody, we're, we're very, very lucky to be able to pick what we eat, eh? Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's, especially now with, like, we think the end of the world just came, but we're still able to go to, like, the IGA and, and decide whether we want, you know, fake meat, uh, beans, tofu, chicken, organic chicken, organic free-range chicken, organic free-range kosher chicken. You know, so we uh, we're in a, a situation where just the fact that we are uh, uh, entitled or able to debate even the quality or the 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 the, the veracity, the authenticity of a bagel. I don't think in history there's been ever a time like that, you know. And I remember discussing that in the conference uh, 10 years ago for the the nutrition conference. I think it was it in the 50s or 60s that the food guide changed its uh, purpose from instructing people how to ingest enough calorie to how to limit the ingestion right. of too much calorie. Yeah. Um, I... We have the luxury of worrying about uh, things that the rest of the world would be very happy to worry Absolutely. about. Absolutely, and it's uh, it's to, the, the, by extent it's the same for vaccination. The fact that we are alive to discuss the whether we are for or against vaccines, uh, yeah. it means that they actually work. Totally, we're, you know? we're very privileged to be able to have those uh, discussions and choices. Yeah. Yeah. As far as the meals that you serve, is there one that is more popular than anything else that people ask for or come there specifically? Oh, yeah. We just, um, when we opened the restaurant, we were a bit, uh, let's say the restaurant opened and we had an, a restaurant that was open in our hands, you know? We were like, oh, damn, the restaurant's open. And then at first we had, we had like very like um, off cots of meats and cheaper things and where like people came in and they're like hey listen you used to cook lobster for me uh, i'm following you guys i want lobster i want a nice steak so we just okay we had to do a lobster spaghetti and at the time we had a friend that was doing a lobster spaghetti with tomatoes out in philadelphia mark vetri and we we, we were big fans of his because he had a 28 seat restaurant and he took four seats out to put a, a ham slicer in so we said oh that guy's crazy like us you know and we're like, okay, we're going to make an homage with him, but instead of tomatoes, we're just going to make the the cream um, cream with lobster. So it's, ours is the white lobster pasta. And that we try to take it off. I don't even know why we try to take it off. but uh, And this is, like, needless to say, as a celiac and by extent often as a lactose intolerant, this is not a dish that I enjoy that often. So the few times that I make it for myself, with the gluten-free pasta, which is not good, uh, I understand why it's on the menu and it's delicious. But that dish is probably one that you that would not translate so well to takeout, or it's not even offered, right? Well, it does. We sell it. It's like a, it's like a, a model car. You know, you get instructions, you, you get do pieces, it yourself. You get, yeah, you know, and you build it yourself. But we we kind of make it easy to build. You know. Yeah. Um, but lobster, again, you know, the lobster prices have gone down recently. Yes, uh, yes, and this is uh, it's funny, eh? We like okay, lobster prices are great, but what does that mean for the lobster stocks? And what does that mean for the 
you know. So I was listening to a lobster fisherman the other day, and he was saying that when the market is very good and the prices are high, they happen they sell all the uh, the cold lobster, the 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 lobster with like a claw missing, or the lobsters that are uh, not you would say grade A. Yeah. And he said that what that was doing is that was like leaving that was taking them out from the the reproductive cycle, so they, that gave better chance for the, like the better lobster. You know, but now the the vendors only purchase from the fishermen the prime lobsters, you know, so they're stuck with those lobsters that they have to throw back. I know, know that the lobster industry in New Brunswick, for example, is in trouble because there's no tourists coming. And, you know, the, yeah. the those big lobster restaurants cater to the, the tourists. And uh, so this thing is impacting everyone everywhere in, in every uh, possible way. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know what, I think, I just hope there is, the border is open here anytime, like re pretty soon, you know, I think we have a, more than a, a good business and touristic relationship with the Northeastern uh, United States. We, we also, we, we are so much alike and it's, we enjoy going to New York and Maine and, and so on and people enjoy coming here. So that for me is critical to the, uh, the good flow of the business in the coming year. Yeah, well, that's not going to happen in the near future, I think. I mean, certainly not till July, the borders, uh, certainly the U.S. borders. Anyway, uh, we hope for the best and... Uh, uh, good luck. Good luck, you know, in setting up the restaurant in a way that will still feel like it's Joe Beef with the ambiance and, and, uh, and hopefully people will come but as we've said, in this business, at this time, everything is up for grabs. Everything is unpredictable. You, you know, I, I think that your, your platform here, and I think I've discussed that with Emily briefly, I think it's fantastic. And I think it's true, uh, conversations like this, and by bringing in uh, building engineers, uh, architect, designers, that the solution will come. Because the layout of a restaurant if you think of any old restaurants, and there was some in Quebec City, there was some in Montreal, like Joe's Steakhouse downtown, where the, the little booths were separated by like stained glasses, you know. But how you can you maybe there's a ventilation a building engineer that can think of the ventilation for that. So every you know, and then it would look like something traditional that you're not. Oh wow, I'm not eating in a bubble. You yeah, know? there's so certainly all those people. Novel ventilation systems that are being designed right now with HEPA filters and and they will clean the air. So we're going to have some innovation. And eventually, you know? and eventually it probably won't look so odd, you know, and, and it, it could still look sexy and cool to have at a restaurant, but I have a feeling that there is gonna be this in-between moment that we're gonna be in shortly, where it's gonna be this transition of not there just yet, you know? Or we're just gonna, I think the most probable outcome is we're gonna forget really quickly because we forget we, we forget the biggest the biggest tragedies like we have family that fought in the second world war and like you know I've, i know people who went through loss of spouses i lost a friend to cancer um you know the pain of childbirth for example and then we have a family of three you know we forget my friend that's because you didn't have to go through the pain <laughs> <laughs> no absolutely but i mean the people forget and and people tend to, um, I just uh, finished reading a fantastic book called Humankind, and it's kind of very optimistic outlook on, 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 on life. And, and it just basically says that people are good, are fundamentally good, and that the media and the some, some of the despot in power try to portray humans as different, differently and as mean, but the fact is we're good, we're tolerant, and I think we have to get, go back to that route, you know. And if the restaurant is a little bit more spaced out, you know, who cares? As long as they, they honestly, at a time where, like, a white cop still can put his knee on the neck of an African-American in the United States, I don't feel that it's my job right now to argue about whether we should be allowed to sit closer or whatever. And I think as a society, we have yeah, bigger expectations in life of what is important. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and keep that in mind. I'd like to devote my, my emotion and intellect to yeah. that thought at, 
a little bit, you know. Anyway, Fred, I'm looking forward to eating a, again at Joe Beef. I see can't. You I can't say that I'm going to be there the first day you open. <laughs> I have to. I have to see what uh, goes on because I am at risk. I'm in that age category, so you know I have to wonder about these things. But but I'm not going to be a hermit. Uh, I will see you. And maybe you'll come back on Thank and give you. us an update uh, when things start rolling again. Hopefully. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot for joining Thank us. Thank you so much. Uh, bye bye. Will, will uh, we'll keep in touch with you to see how the, uh, the first days go because that's going to be very meaningful. Yeah. Thank okay, you for thanks, Fred. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. All right, we're going to. Here's a little bit from talking about really outstanding gourmet food to, to more down to earth food. So let me mm -hmm. welcome Joel Tyman, who's originally from Montreal, but uh, he has opened up a Montreal style deli in New York. And uh, originally, of course, the idea was smoked meat, bagel, and all kinds of things. We can dis certainly discuss that. Uh, as, as far as it comes to bagel, I mean, there's not much to discuss. Montreal is the, is the best. There's, there's no question. I'm, I'm not even willing to entertain a discussion about New York bagel. It's, it's not a bagel. It's a, it's a roll with a hole in it. All right. Anyway, Joel, uh, opening up a Montreal-style deli in New York. That was an unusual thing to do. What what prompted that? So um, I can't take uh, you know full credit. Um, one of my friends was living in New York, and he missed his smoke meat, and uh, we were both uh, not uh, as happy as possible in in law school at the time. Different law schools. Uh, and the next thing you know, there was a restaurant opening, and I was to drive down to, to New York and uh, you know here we are many years later and I'm living in New York and uh, you know we're proudly serving smoked meat and bagels and poutine and you know all the things that uh, we we're kind of uh, proud of in, in Montreal and uh, in Canada uh, from our from our culinary traditions and uh, along with kind of the Jewish food that I grew up with now I know at first you were carting Montreal bagels down there Right, you were. Oh, I fill up my, uh, my old Volkswagen with 120 dozen at midnight. Uh, show up at the border half an hour later with all the bagels. They look at me like I was insane. Um, but it's a, it's you know, it's a Canadian-made product, so NAFTA, so they let me through. And um, were you no show up in New York? Were you fresh known? Bagels. Were you known as the bagel guy? Like, did they know every Friday? Did you bring them for them? Like, how did that work? Um, so it's funny. They, they definitely got to know me because. I was showing up at like the graveyard shift uh, on the commercial side where the trucks normally go. Um, but, uh, and then there were some of them, I would see them uh, very often uh, when I would come back, I would stop at the little grocery store just near the border, the small border, and that's where they would shop. So I'd see them, I'd talk to them, and you know, they, they weren't allowed to accept bagels. Once I left a few packages right outside the door and apparently they, they disappeared. Now I assume you're making them down there. So I did, um, we did open up another, another uh, uh, bagel shop called Black Seed Bagels uh, that I'm no longer affiliated with. Um, and they do kind of, it, it started out being a, a real hybrid bagel um, where they took the baking techniques and the wood burning oven and the honey water, but they, uh, the dough itself um, was retarded in a way that's a little untraditional for Montreal bagels. Um, I think they're very good. They're much closer to a Montreal bagel than to a New York bagel. Um, but it's kind of like um, just taking modern technique and looking at a Montreal bagel and being like, oh, could we change it a little bit? And it would be sacrilegious for St. Viateur or Fairmont to mess with the recipe. But, you know... Um, one of the things that uh, chefs can't help doing is they tinker. Whenever I would hire a new chef over the years, they just want to change the menu and change this and change that. And I'm lucky now that I'm at a point where I can say to the new chef, hey, you're not changing smoked meat, you're not changing the poutine, you're not changing you know, this, but you can make a new salad, you can make a, a special poutine of the month, or like Give you can have some creativity. Some creativity, yeah. 
but uh, the menu is what it is for the most part. Maybe you want to describe what a poutine is. We have some listeners here who may not know about this Quebec delicacy. Well, poutine is French fries with uh, cheddar cheese curds. And traditionally, in Montreal, it would be a beef gravy that probably comes from a can. Uh, we like to use our roasted chicken stock as the base for the gravy. So uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, very often some Montrealers come and they say, oh, this is really good, but something's different. And it's really just that we're, not, we're using a really high quality meat. You ever put smoked meat onto the poutine? Of course, yeah. Well, always. that's why, that's, well, well, the mile you in, always have that event. No, sorry, I was going to say that you guys, I mean, what's what's so awesome about the Mile End Deli is that you guys are a deli and you offer all these traditional types of things, but with your own twist. And it's actually much more... Um, like some become almost delicacy-like things. Now, the poutine with the smoked meat wouldn't be a delicacy, but you have other beautiful things that you serve there that is like a nice, a cool twist, modern twist on the traditional. Yeah, so, I mean, like an example of something Emily's talking about, I don't know if this is what she's thinking of, but we have what we call the Mont Royal, which is Jewish potato latkes with uh, creme fraiche, some, uh, some nice locks, and uh, a little bit of caviar. Um, you know, it's just a really nice, warming, comfort food dish, but it's like an elegant presentation. And it's, you know, it's not too fancy, but it's, you know, it's a little different. A little, you know, it's a little, little mean, different. The only acceptable bagel argument is between Fairmont and St. Vieter. I'll, I'll, I'll accept people arguing about, I just don't accept anyone arguing about non-Montreal bagels against Montreal bagel. So when no, you... I, I, listen, I'm, I, I'm in agreement. You know, I'm a San Vieter boy myself. I grew up in Ville Saint Laurent, so there was one in the Esposito. Uh, so that's where we'd go get bagels on the weekend. Um, so I'm not going to argue you there. But all I will say, all I will say about New York bagels is you can do things with New York bagels that you can't really do very well with a Montreal bagel. Like what? Interesting. And it's not, I, so, for instance, you go to, like, any bagel shop in New York and you want to get sliced turkey on a bagel, you want to get uh, bacon, egg, and cheese on a bagel, like, you can kind of put more things that they can, it's a roll with a hole. Like, I'm going to insult the bagel. Because it could be a sandwich. Roll with a hole, but you can do all different things. Like, I would not really put, like, bacon, egg, and cheese on a Montreal bagel. It would fall through the hole. You know, right. I just said Thanks. that last week. Last week, I was craving a New York bagel scooped with with smoked, with smoked uh, cream cheese and smoked salmon. And I looked at my husband and I said, there's nowhere here in Montreal where you could just go for, I mean, you could go to Real Bagel and just pick up a bagel like that or something, or, or St. Theater. But it's not the same to get the actual sandwich like that, where people walk around like in foil and that's their breakfast. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the bodega, the corner store right. sandwich in New York is like, it's sacrilege. It's, it's, it's part of the day. It's part of right. like, like people have, it's like, it's like, you know, there's like Americans who are kind of going out there and they're hardcore. And like I'm American. I am free. I don't have to wear a mask or something like that. But in New York, you have the right to a bacon, egg and cheese sandwich for three or four dollars right. in the corner, three minutes. And that's you know, it. that's just part of it. Like well, when, when you first uh, introduced the Montreal bagel in, uh, in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. the, I guess the uh, non-official adults. How did they take to it? Um, so I believe it was the New York Daily News ran an op-ed threatening to flog us out of town with salamis. It was something along the lines of you can import wine from Italy, cheese from France, but how dare you import a bagel from New York to New York? Uh, was kind of the attitude. But um, the, I think people like them. And the truth is, 100 years ago, the bagels in New York were much closer to the Montreal bagels. Um, like a lot of things, as um, technology and industry changed, and suddenly there could be machines that could portion the dough and shape the dough and do all these things, you know, the Industrial Revolution sort of trans found its way to bagels. And in Montreal, we've preserved bagel making for what it is, for the art form that it really is. I think so let's get to a more serious business. <clears throat> okay. Smoke meat. <laughs> okay. With the bagel, all right, there's yeah. these kind of arguments. Smoke meat, Montreal smoke meat is the best. 
I yeah. think Schwartz, Schwartz's is the best. They, they, spell, they spell their name wrong, but anyway, it, it, it is the best. So uh, what are you doing for smoke meat? So we do our version of Montreal smoke meat. Um, and it is, it's, it's, it's not going to get mistaken for pastrami. Um, it is, uh, very much inspired by Montreal smoked meat. Uh, we do put m a more aggressive smoke on it. So it's a little bit more like Texas, Texas barbecue in that sense. There's a little bit more of a smoke crust and I'll tell you a secret. Somebody's going to get upset at me here, but, um, if you go to Schwartz's, ask them to see their smoker. They don't have one. They have this ancient oven where the fat drips down and it makes the smoke, but it is in by no means a traditional smoker. Um, and it's just, you know, now, now the other places in town, we're not going to talk about them. They're not as good, but it, it, the, some of them use smokers. But um, so ours compared to Schwartz's, we're definitely more, uh, it's, there's, a, there's a more of a smoke crust on the meat. Um, and the other thing, um, you know, we're not doing nearly the volume that Schwartz's is doing. You know, we're smoking eight to ten briskets at a time, you know, sometimes up to three, four or five days a week. Um, and, you know, we can control it a little bit better. Um, and usually if there's a brisket that I don't like or I think, it's too lean or it's this or, you know, we'll save it. We'll put it on poutine. We won't make a sandwich with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do people come in um, for fatty or lean? So we thought about that um, when we opened and we decided that we're just going to make every sandwich medium because New Yorkers, you know, anybody anywhere else, and I'm sure this mistake happens all the time with tourists at Schwartz's is they ask for it lean and then they're like, what is this? It's dry. It's, you know, like, listen, you can eat, if you're going to eat, if you, you can't, if you're going to eat smoked meat, eat it medium, eat it fatty. Even if you go once every five years, don't that's, eat it. Lean. That's what I tell people. Uh, eat I mean, it, it's not healthier. Way you like it, but eat it rarely, not yeah. rare. <laughs> right. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting story. This goes back many years, about uh, uh, over 40 years. When I took a, a colleague who was not from Montreal uh, to Schwartz's for uh, a smoked meat sandwich, she was uh, from the States and she didn't know anything about anything. So anyway, I played it up, of course. And so she orders a smoked meat sandwich and I said, you have to have a, a fry and you have to have a dill pickle and a, a cherry cola with it. Okay. And she says, well, uh, I think I'll have a glass of milk. So wait for the waitress. That's not the way it's supposed to happen. The waitress who was there uh, had been there for eons. <gasps> she had this huge beehive hairdo, which was, you know, in style 50 years ago. My or grandmother whenever. had one. Okay, so, so anyway, the so my colleague there, we come to ordering, and uh, there's a I'll have to smoke meat, the French fry, and a pickle, and I have a glass of milk. And the waitress looks at her and says, No. <laughs> <laughs> she did not serve that. She did not serve that, and uh, she did enjoy the cherry uh, cola after. And uh, yeah, but that's hilarious. Yeah, it, it's hard to explain to people that that milk does not go with uh, smoked meat. Probably don't even have milk at Schwartz's. Uh, I probably no. not. No. no. Probably, probably. Yeah, yeah. Tell me, how much do you charge for a smoked meat sandwich? So I mean, we've gone different prices over the years. Uh, right now, we offer two sizes. Um, a, uh, a regular, which is um, about uh, seven ounces, and we charge $16. And a, uh, a large, which is 14 ounces, so almost a pound, and we charge $21. U.S., wow. of course. That's hefty. U.S. But I, yeah, what's US. the sandwich of Schwartz's now? 10, 12 bucks? For um, like a regular, the only one size. I, th I think just a sandwich is $6.95. Really? I think so. Yeah, just a sandwich. It's still a really, really good price. And the the uh, with the with the fries, the pickle, and the drink, there it comes to like thirteen, fourteen, something. Okay. Like that. Oh my God. So even you, even you, my mouth is watering at this point. <laughs> you, you have French fries. Do I have French? How much do I charge for French fries? 
No, no do you, you sell you sell French fries? Well, of course, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So now here here's a real. This is a significant question. Yes. I hope they are not frozen. No. Okay. No, no, no. twice cooked, hand cut. Okay. We don't. We don't no, 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 no. Jo Joe, when Come we're on. when we're allowed back in New York. And we're going to travel. We will, Joel, we will be at the Mile End. <laughs> we will yeah, pay well, you to visit. There's, there's no such thing as a good frozen fry. Uh, it's got to be. Agree. Yeah, very good. So, okay, now seriously yeah. about COVID. So what, yes. what, did it, what did it do for your business? Um, it, um, I mean, the first thing I'm going to say is that, um, you know, I've lived in New York for eight years and uh, it's the New York, cri the crisis in New York is it, it's it's very it's very serious. And, you know, New York as a city is going to take a long time to recover. So, so I kind of at first was like, OK, there's a bunch of things that are going to happen here and. We will or we won't have a business at the end of this. I don't know. Um, I don't, you know, uh, it, it's very hard to say. Um, but the first thing that I thought of was my employees. And, you know, what what are the ramifications on them if uh, if they, if they, if I can't, if I close the doors? Because uh, a lot of restaurants, you know, some of the biggest restaurateurs in the city even before the city mandated, they just shut down all their restaurants, laid off all their employees, um, no severance pay, nothing. Um, and, you know, they went into pure survival mode. And, you know, I talked to all my guys and, and, and girls, but a lot of my kitchen staff happened to be men. Um, and they've been with me for, you know, many years. And I said, if you want to work, because some people don't want to come to work, some people didn't want to deal with anything. If you want to work, we will stay open. I will find a way to make sure that you're making the same thing you are now. And what we did was we um, put everybody at the same level of salary, so really egalitarian, and started to uh, split the tips. And everybody was doing everything. There was no more front of house getting all the tips, back of house making all the food. If it was quiet, the front of house were portioning like coleslaws, if it was, uh, if, if the, the back of house would give somebody their takeout order. Uh, I have dishwashers working the counter. I have cooks working the counter when it's quiet. Um, and so we kind of uh, disturbed the industry standard a little bit just to make sure that we could, you know, keep it going for everyone's uh, personal sake, for their ability to feed their families. That was the most important thing for me um, because I could be in the same position as the owner. I could be in the same position if I closed the restaurant and just waited. Like I can't afford to pay my rent whether I'm open or whether I'm closed. So, so that's happened with the seating. Well, we, it went right away to just take out and delivery, um, which is a pretty, it was already a pretty big part of my business. Um, so, uh, you know, we just kind of went, we basically revenue just cut in half right at the beginning. And it's slowly been trying to um, climb its way up as people people really went into a serious lockdown. And there were a lot of people did not leave their house for weeks. But as it got better and people started getting more comfortable and the mask wearing and, you know, people are a little bit more out and about. Uh, they changed the rules to let you sell uh, cocktails and alcohol beverage to go. So now you see people at night, they go, they walk to one bar, they get a drink, they walk, to, they come by my restaurant, they get a, a hot dog or something else and then a beer and they walk to the next place. So th that's, you know, there's people, there's a new life that's starting and people are trying to figure it out. What is it looking like now for opening up? I was just going to ask the same thing. Uh, so New York just entered phase one. Um, if all goes well, phase two will start in about two weeks, a little less than two weeks. Phase two means that uh, restaurants can do outdoor seating. Um, I don't have any outdoor seating. Um, we are looking at putting some picking tables and stuff outside. Um, but, um, I'm not going to offer any type of table service, uh, whether it's outside or inside. 
uh, even so even when phase three would come hopefully in July or August, uh, I'm not going to rush back to table service. Um, it's a very small space, and I think that it's not worth having um, people feel uncomfortable. Exactly. Even if I put half the number of people in there, it's still very tight. So you'll have people going in, ordering at the counter, then waiting outside or something and taking it and maybe sitting at a picnic table. Yeah, we have a takeout window, and we've had our own web-based online ordering system for years now. Uh, you know, I was trying already years ago to get away from the high marketing fees of these different um, order order services. Um, so I did my own. It cost me about $150 a month, and then after that, it's, it's just whatever. Um, so there's an app. There's people can order. So already I would say that over half of our sales come in through that. People call in their orders. Um, but it's, it's primarily that, uh, the other thing we did, um, which was really try to, to try to boost, uh, morale and try to, um, give a little bit of, um, kind of community appreciation and interactiveness is we started to basically fundraise that people could donate a meal, uh, for a hospital worker. So, uh, I'm really, really proud to say that we've actually sent, uh, over 3000 meals to um, six or seven different hospitals in Brooklyn and Manhattan uh, over the course of the past three months. That's and that's primarily driven by our customer generosity. Awesome. Um, and just, you know, a way that I, I think our staff keeps them busy, makes them feel like they're doing something a little bit more important than just making a sandwich or a salad. Okay, one more question, the bagel, uh, fresh or toasted? It, for myself personally? Yeah. I, personally, if I get a fresh bagel, it's fresh. You don't need to toast it. But unfortunately, I typically live off of Montreal bagels that are coming out of my freezer. So we know what's happening with those. Right. I, I, have, I have to also, tell you. Also, 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 Joe, I have to say, um, my mother is busy texting me that the smoked meat sandwich is ten seventy five at Schwartz's. <laughs> really? Maybe yeah. that's maybe the so. Big apparently, one. you're not paying for your sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I tell you something. This is a research project right now, and as soon as I sign off here on my way home, I am stopping at Schwartz's and I'm getting a smoked meat sandwich. And get the fries. And I will get the fries yeah. because I know that they're fresh and I know they've been so double good. fried. Yeah. But I have to say, you know, I just watched on Netflix, um, you know, there's all the food shows, obviously. So the latest season with Phil Rosenthal, you know, Somebody Feed Phil. Uh, mm -hmm. He's the creator of Everybody Loves, Ray Loves Raymond. And he did a, did an episode in Montreal here, and he actually did. He, he talked about Joe Beef and everything, um, and then they went to Saint Vieter, and they met uh, the guy. I, I forget his name. The, 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 like the guy in charge, which I'm sure you know, uh, Joel. Patterns. Yeah, like the older gentleman also. Um, and he said the way that he loves to eat it because he's Italian, is he likes to have the fresh bagel, not toasted, so straight out of the oven, with some cream cheese and fresh figs. Isn't that interesting? Ooh. Because it was also like the influence of his Italian, like the figs, the fresh fruit and a fresh bagel. And then Phil tried it. And I'm, in my head, I was like, he's totally eating something not Montreal at all, but extremely unique, obviously, to St. Peter. Well, you know, Anthony Bourdain had a Montreal uh, episode as well. He had a few. A few. few of them, yeah. Yeah. You? Uh, yeah. I own some. Yeah, he did yeah. the small and yeah. 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 yeah, he did. All right. Well, now I'm hungry. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I need uh, refreshment. I need my smoked meat, which I, I rarely have. But but this talk made me hungry uh, for it. So when are you back to New York? Oh. Uh, hopefully at the end of the month. Well, we didn't say because Joel, maybe we should just say, Joel's wife is an emergency room doctor, right? Yes. And she was pregnant in the when COVID started happening and everything. And in fact, she too got COVID. Um, and you could, her last days of work was when the hospital started ramping up and you guys were able to to get to Canada. Yeah, we you know my wife uh, came to me a few basically a couple of days after her last shift and she was just like I don't think and I'll just say that my wife is as tough as they come and was we had to she, her colleagues had to basically pull her out of the emergency room even though she was sick with covid because everybody was working sick. Like that was, there was no, there was no options in New York at the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, they pulled, you know, they pulled her out. And then a couple of days later, she was like, 
I think the maternity department is getting turned into an ICU. Uh, let's go to Canada to have the baby. So, uh, you know, I'm in her hometown of Calgary right now. And um, uh, we have a beautiful, uh, actually two month old today, uh, son, or not, our second son. And uh, we'll we're to go back with the, we got his passport now and we can try to go back to New York very soon. Very good. All right. Stay safe. Well, with you, we will we will not broach the topic of bagels in Calgary. We will <laughs> leave that alone. Uh, and uh, so, once you get back to New York and start everything up, uh, we'll we'll have another chat to see just yeah, how it is it. going. Yeah, that would be great. We'd yeah. love to, you know, let you because know how it's going. You, whatever is going to happen is nothing like what people are predicting are going to happen. Whatever happens is going to be different. It's uh, it's it's yeah. a new it's a new reality. Yeah. And uh, restaurants are just one, one part of it. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. And thanks, thanks for having me. For Thank you, Joel. All. Thanks so much. And, uh, hope that uh, you also got a good taste of uh, Montreal food, even though it's only over uh, the internet and we can't really give you a taste. And eventually, some of you who are not from Montreal will be able to come here and have a real taste of bagel and smoke. Or if you're in New York, you can come to my restaurant. <laughs> or in New York. Or in New York. Okay, great. Bye, everyone. So bye. Thank you. Bye.